invite you to turn with me to the book of Luke, chapter number 1, verses 26 through 38 is what we'll be looking at today. And uh, by the way, I'm once again a dangerous pastor because I did not wear my watch today and I do not have my cell phone on me. So I have no idea what time it is. Can someone tell me what time it is? 11.20. 11.20, okay. So that'll get in my head, kind of what, how much, what time frame I have here. Thank you. 11.40, thank you. 11.45, 11.45. I am always trusting you for your support, Larry. All right, well, we're at Luke chapter number 1, verses 26 through 38. And this, of course, is the... Uh, uh, scripture in which uh, the angel is visiting uh, visiting Mary and uh, telling her that she would give birth to Jesus. So let's go ahead and read the scripture. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, and that's Mother John the Baptist, the stories tie together. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth to a town in Galilee. To a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. Isn't that a great line, by the way? I'm not preaching on that particular line, but you may want to underline that. Do not be afraid. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. We, of course, are in Christmas season. And Christmas season is typically kicked off by what we call Black Friday. And I don't know if you participate in all that craziness of Black Friday or not. Um, I don't do that. Uh, I'm just, uh, you know, saving $20 on a VC or VCR or DVD player now. Uh, is it worth all the hassle of what they go through? I think people who do that, uh, and if you're one of them, forgive me, but I think they're a little bit nuts <laughs> to get involved in all of that. I remember one year in Lipstick, uh, it was about a Thursday night at 8 o'clock, and I had to run to Walmart for something. We were making something for the following day, and we didn't have some ingredients we thought we had, and Walmart was the only place open to go. And I didn't even really think about Black Friday. I just thought, well, I'll run to Walmart and get what I need. And it was about 8 miles away from where we lived, and I drove there, and the parking lot was jammed Full. You never see the Walmart parking lot full. I mean, they're so huge, these parking lots. Jam full. I had a hard time finding a place to even park. And, uh, of course, by then I'm reminded, oh, Black Friday starts actually Thursday. And I think it started at 10 o'clock. This was about 8.30. So I finally park a mile away, and I get into the Walmart. And every aisle is jammed full of people, of product. Where I needed to go was blocked off. I couldn't even get to the food to get what I needed. And I'm trying to find some way to get what I needed. And um, 
Finally, I find this poor young guy who looked like a deer caught in the headlights. <laughs> and I told him, you know, I, I'm, I'm just here. I need whatever it was, eggs, sugar, whatever, you know, three or four items. That I, I can't get to it. And he looked at me like I had three heads. Like, you're here to shop for food? All right, we'll try and get it for you. And uh, so they finally get what I need, put it in the cart, and I'm trying to wheel my way. I mean, this Walmart was packed. I don't know how, how long this line it is, um, but uh, there in Ottawa, it was just jam-packed. You couldn't hardly get anywhere. People lined up beside these products they wanted to get, right? At, at 10 o'clock and all that camped out and so finally I, I'm going through and everyone's I can hear her making comments he's shopping what's he been here shopping for and uh, finally get what I need but that that's just to me it's a little nutty <laughs> but uh, God bless I, and my my uh, daughter Denise and her husband uh, do the Black Friday thing so some people enjoy it and more power to you but uh, that's kind of the unofficial kickoff to the Christmas season. <clears throat> and uh, from that point forward, we're just inundated with commercials, songs, specials, all kinds of Christmas movies. And by the way, I'll give you a spoiler alert here. Uh, the guy always ends up with the girl at the end of those movies. No matter what happens, they always end up together. That's just the way those movies are. Uh, you got parties, gatherings, events. There's all kinds of special stuff surrounding Christmas. And of course, we in the church are not immune to this because we have our own special events and things that we do around celebrating the birth of Christ. And one of the things just about every church does is they have some sort of pageant or play about the nativity, about the birth of Christ. Yeah, children's play, some of it's an adult, full-fledged adult play, some are very simply done uh, with, uh, you know, kids wearing bathrobes and a towel on their head. Others are uh, elaborately done, big stage productions with professional lighting and all of that, but just about every church does something along those lines. And it doesn't matter whether it's a huge, elaborate, Broadway-type production or whether it's a simple little child's play, the cast of characters remain pretty much the same. You have Mary, of course, and Joseph, and you have the baby Jesus, and shepherds and wise men, and maybe King Herod or another character too thrown in. The innkeeper's often thrown in there. And of course, these characters and uh, these things come from Scripture. That's where the story comes from. And have you ever wondered, why does God give us so much detail about the birth of Jesus? Why did the Holy Spirit inspire, especially Matthew and Luke, to write about the birth of Christ and tell us about all these different characters and things surrounding the birth of Christ? Well, of course, one reason for it is it proves the validity of Jesus' claim to be the Messiah. It showed that he did come from the house and lineage of David. It shows uh, that he did come as prophecy told that he would come, being born in Bethlehem and things of that nature. So that's one reason God includes it, is to show Jesus is the Messiah. But another reason is the reason God always gives us stories in the Bible. And that is so we can learn from these characters. You know, the Bible's not just a theology book. It doesn't have just ten points of theology. God tells us what we're to know through stories. The Bible predominantly is a book of stories. And God does that for a reason. So that we can look at these individuals and learn from them. And the same thing, uh, same truth surrounds the story of Christ's birth. He tells about these individuals so we can learn from them. So that's what we're going to do for the next three preaching Sundays that I have. Of course, next week I won't be uh, presenting a message. The tallies will be here. But for the next three preaching Sundays, we're going to look at three characters of Christmas found within the Bible. And examine their lives and see how they responded or what they did concerning the birth of Christ. Because here's the thing, as we examine their response to Christ, we see that that in many ways is how others today respond to Christ. 
That's the idea behind it. These are people just like us with the same hang-ups, the same fears, the same issues, the same needs that we have. And how they responded to the announcement of Christ, to the coming of Jesus, is a snapshot of us, of the human race. How we respond. And so that's what we're going to look at today. And of course, we'll be looking at the most central character about the birth of Jesus, besides Christ himself, and that being Mary. And we're, I want to look at three things that are found in this scripture concerning Mary. I want to look at Mary's life, Mary's dilemma, and then Mary's response. And I believe there's a lot we can learn from this. First of all, let's look at Mary's life. What is it about Mary? What's her background? What's going on here? Well, the first thing we read is that Mary was from the town of Nazareth, which was a town in Galilee. Now, Nazareth, we hear about it. We know Jesus called the Nazarene, of course, Church of the Nazarene. That's where we get our name as a denomination. But in Jesus' day, Nazareth was certainly not a prominent town. As a matter of fact, um, I read that in archaeology, there's really no mention outside of Scripture itself of the town of Nazareth uh, until about 200 A.D. or so. And that doesn't mean it didn't exist. It simply means it was not a, a prominent town, at least not prominent enough for us to find any writing about. And so Nazareth was just a small little town, some estimate around 400 people or so made their home there. And it was a town that really of ill repute in a way. It was a kind of the other side of the track type of a town. Because we see this when uh, Philip brings Nathaniel or begins to tell Nathaniel about Jesus Christ and that he's from Nazareth. The first words out of Nathaniel's mouth is, can anything good come from Nazareth? And so it wasn't a town of, of good reputation at all. It was a poor town, a little town of a uh, town of not a good uh, reputation, a town of no prominence. And yet, this is what I'm trying to get at. God takes this little town that no one's really ever heard of, and those who have heard of it don't particularly like it. This little town of 400-some people. And out of that town, he picks this obscure maiden, this little virgin girl, no one's ever heard of. And he chooses her. To be the vessel that he uses to fulfill the promise of the ages. I mean, the birth of Jesus is central to God's plan for all of humanity. Even history is split between his coming B.C. and A.D. This is central to his eternal plan of the ages. And yet he picks this obscure girl no one's ever heard of from this town that people don't particularly like, that has no prominence whatsoever. And he chooses her to fulfill his purpose and will. And let me tell you, if God can use a peasant girl from a nothing town to fulfill his greatest promise to Adam's fallen race, he can certainly use you. He can use you. Don't ever let Satan tell you that you're not good enough, you're not smart enough, you're not rich enough, you're not talented enough, you come from the wrong side of town, your past is too checkered, you have failed too much. Don't ever let Satan tell you that. Because God will use anybody, anyone, I don't care who they are, anyone who is, has a heart that is surrendered and hands that are willing to serve. Amen. He can use you if you'll let him. And so Mary was from Nazareth. We also see here she was a virgin, which tells us she was... Uh, upright in character. She was moral in character. Not perfect. We don't believe at all. The Bible teaches Mary that was sinless. But uh, we do believe she was honored among women. As a matter of fact, Mary a few verses later calls God her Savior. She needed a Savior just like we do. But she was moral. She was in a place where God could use her. She was surrendered to Him and, and serving Him. And then we see that she was pledged to be married to Joseph. 
And uh, this pledge is kind of akin to our engagement, but it goes mu it's a much stronger bind than our engagement. And of course, when people get engaged today, it's a very serious step in their relationship, the next step being marriage, but there's no legal ramifications to being engaged. You can break an engagement off without uh, there being any legal ramifications to it. But in Jesus' day, to be pledged to somebody uh, was basically, legally, the same as being married, except you're not cohabiting yet. But to, to break that engagement, to break that pledge, yeah, you had to go through legal steps of divorce actually to do it. And so this was a very strong bond. And, and uh, more than likely, there's an inference in Scripture that Mary and Joseph cared for one another. We certainly see this in Joseph's reaction when he found out that Mary was, was pregnant. He didn't react in just anger and lashing out. I'm going to get even with her and make a spectacle of her, which he probably would have done had he cared nothing for her. But we see that he's contemplating his mind, putting her away privately, handling this in the least invasive way possible, showing he had some feelings for her. And we assume vice versa. And so the point I'm making is that her life's planned out. She knows what she's going to do. I'm pledged to be married to this man of upright character, Joseph. We're going to make a family together. I'll be a good Jewish housewife and fulfill that role. And so her life pretty well planned out. And then we see she's highly favored of God, blessed among women. The Lord is with her. And by the way, let me just interject this. You are highly favored of God if the Lord is with you. If you're in Christ, and Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. He is with you and you are highly favored. It doesn't matter what your present circumstances are. You are highly favored. And then she was chosen, as we saw, to bear the holy seed of God. To give birth to the very Son of God. I was thinking about this. What <coughs> tremendous privilege that is. I mean, think about it. We already mentioned 4,000 years of promises. All the way back to Genesis 3.15. And I will put an enmity, God tells Satan, between you and the woman. Between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Mary is the her of that prophecy. She's the one that will give birth to the one who will crush Satan's head. She is the fulfillment of four thousand years of promises. She would carry that fulfillment within her. Every hope of lost wayward man, she will carry within her. Every tear stain and broken heart of Adam's fallen race, every cry of deliverance from this bondage, she was chosen to bear the answer, the only answer for our redemption. That's Mary's life. Not in a particularly good town, unknown, moral character, able to be used of God, pledged to be married, life planned out. And then God comes along and he turns her world upside down. You notice the angel told her, you're blessed. And of course... Given 2,000 years or so of perspective, we look back at Mary's life and say, oh, she is blessed. She's privileged to do this. And that she was. But did you ever stop and think what kind of dilemma this announcement of this angel put Mary in? What it did to her plans for her life? Did you ever think about that? I mean, uh, you ever think what the cost was for her to say yes to this? As I said, Mary's world is about to turn upside down because basically God just informed Mary that she would become an unwed mother. That she would become an unwed mother. Now think through the implications of that. What would her family think? I mean, What's she going to tell her mom and dad? The Bible makes no mention of Mary's parents or what type of family life she held. But we assume she was living at home in the typical Jewish home and having a typical Jewish family. What more would they think? Here she is pledged to be married to Joseph and she turns out pregnant. What are they going to think? 
What's the little town of Nazareth sort of thing? I mean, you know what it's like in a small town, especially a town of 400. There's no secrets. Everyone knows whatever's happening in everyone else's life. What's this going to do to her reputation? What's this going to do to how people treat her? Think about this. What would the synagogue think? Now, I know in our culture, church on every corner type of a thing, if, if uh, God forbid you ever get kicked out of one church, I hope that never happens to you, but if that happens to someone, they can just go to the next church, start over. But in, in Jesus' day, the synagogue was the center of the Jewish life. And if you got kicked out of that, if you got excommunicated from that, you got excommunicated from community life. You were an outcast. What's going to happen to her? And then most importantly, I'm sure that ran through her mind, what would, what, what's Joseph going to think? What is this man of God whom I love, whom I'm pledged to be married to, we have our life planned out, what in the world is he going to think? When I tell him that I'm pregnant and he knows he's not the father, am I just going to say, oh, don't worry about it, God told me he got me pregnant. What man's going to believe that? No one's going to believe that. I got pregnant at prayer meeting. Praying to God. No one's going to believe that. What's going to happen here in my future? What's, going, what's Joseph going to do? He's not going to want to marry me now. I'm going to become an outcast of society. My own family may even shun me. And disown me. Think about the dilemma she's in. Her. She has her plans laid out, but now they're in shambles. Every relationship she held dear is now in jeopardy. Her future is just completely unknown. Has that ever happened to you? Where you think, man, I got things planned out, things going well, what's going to happen, that's going to happen. And then something comes along and in a matter, it seems, of seconds, Everything changes. All that you thought, all that you planned, all that you hoped for, it just vanishes right in front of your eyes. And now you're stood, you're standing facing an unknown. This just huge unknown. What's going to happen? Maybe it's a doctor's report you never saw coming. Maybe it's a financial crisis you didn't know you'd be going through. It just came out of the blue. Or a phone call in the middle of the night, which I'm sure this family we just prayed for, the McHenry family received, that just changes everything. Maybe it's a specific call of God on your life that you never had in your plans. But God put His finger, a call to the ministry, a call to serve in a certain capacity within the church, a call to give in a very sacrificial way. But somewhere along the line, God comes in or something happens in like Mary, whatever it is, your world's turned upside down and life will never be the same. Everything changes. That's the dilemma facing Mary. But the question is, how do you respond? Well, let's look at what Mary did. What do you do when your world falls apart in a few seconds? Well, and do what a lot of people do and kind of complain and curse the darkness and you let doubt and fear and depression just overwhelm you you can grow angry and resentful you can do all those things but I encourage you and I encourage myself to be like Mary this young virgin girl from the wrong side of the tracks now the first thing she does is she questions how can this be and by the way, it's okay to question. Question and doubt and dis unbelief are different things. It's okay to question. Lord, why is this happening? Lord, how is this going to work out? Lord, I don't understand. That's perfectly normal. And uh, most of us, unless you're a, a super saint, will do that when things come along like this. How can this be is her question. I don't know how it's going to work out. I'm a virgin. I don't understand why or how or when. And when you ask those questions, God may choose to give you specific answers and show you a little more insight like he did Mary here. Or he may simply choose to remind you nothing is impossible with God. And that's the key verse in all this explanation. I, I don't think for a minute Mary truly understood what God was 
was telling her through this angel that the Holy Spirit will come upon you and all that. I'm sure she didn't grasp all the significance of it, but I'm sure she understood the last part. Nothing is impossible with God. And you may not know how, you may not know when, you may not know why, but one thing God wants to remind you of, if you stand facing a future that's unknown, is nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible with God. And if you will follow Him, He'll see you through this. He's got a path for you to walk. Nothing is impossible with God. And so first she questions, and that's fine. But then that question leads to surrender. I want you to look at verse 38 again. The first thing she said, I mean... Think about it. Put it in the context. What's going through her mind right now? Joseph. What am I going to tell him? How is my family going to react? What's this going to do with my social standing within the community? And I'm going to become an outcast. Is this going to just totally ruin my entire life? Every plan I've had is out the window now. I don't know what's going to happen. Think about the confusion, the doubt, the fear that could be flooding her mind. And yet, in the midst of all that, she surrenders. And she says, I am the Lord's servant. You belong to God. You are His servant. Not the other way around. You are His servant. And God loves us. And we can have full confidence to be that bond servant that just surrenders ourselves to Him. I am the Lord's servant. This is not my life. This is not about what I think should happen. It's not about what I desire, what's pleasing or easy or right in my eyes for me. Ultimately, I am the Lord's servant. We need to have that mindset. I belong to you, God. I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. Whereas this version says, or different versions of NIV, by the way. May it be to me as you have said. Or I like the way the King James Version puts it. Be it unto me according to thy word. I'm yours to do with what you will. And since I belong to you, be it unto me according to your word. No matter what the implications, no matter what the cost, no matter what the unknown, be it unto me according to your word. That needs to be our answer. When we're facing the great unknown. Lord, I belong to you. I'm your servant. And though I may not know how, when, or why, be it unto me according to your word. I think that's a, something every one of us need to memorize. And just put over our whole life. Be it unto me, Lord, according to thy word. You called me into missions. You called me into ministry. You called me in a particular line of service. Be it unto me according to thy word. You called me to be that true witness at work. You told me to go speak to that neighbor that I'm not comfortable speaking with. You told me to give that very sacrificial gift. You told me to care for that person. Be it unto me according to thy word. It will cost me, but be it unto me according to my word. My dreams and plans are laid aside, but be it unto me according to thy word. Everything's going to change when I step into this thing, but be it unto me according to thy word. That needs to be our response. <coughs> Mary's response, as I said, should be etched on the heart of every believer. Whatever God calls you to do, be it unto me according to thy word. And whatever promise God gives you, be it unto me according to thy word. God promises his provision, does he not? My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. Be it unto me according to thy word. By his stripes you are healed. Be it unto me according to thy word. I want God's word. To be manifested, made flesh in my life. And it will only be when I have that kind of response. 
So let's look at Mary's results as we wrap this up. So Mary, in verse 38, says yes to the call of God. Yes. What did that yes to God do in terms of Mary's life? Well, we have the asset of hindsight. We can look and read what it did. One of the things it did is it did bring tremendous sacrifice into her life. Tremendous pain she never would have had to deal with otherwise. She did have Joseph's initial reaction. Of course, we don't, the Bible doesn't tell us how her family or, or her town reacted, but we know how Joseph reacted. He was going to put her away. He was going to end the engagement. Because he didn't believe for a second God did this. He's going to end the thing. Of course, God took care of that. But can you imagine the turmoil of Mary's heart before God spoke to Joseph? We then have, after the birth of Jesus, the flight into Egypt they had to make to save Christ's life. You think that was easy? You know, it's kind of a blurb in the Bible, but think about that. Uprooting everything. People back then didn't travel like that. But they uprooted everything and had to go to a foreign country. Sacrifice. There's a scorn of her contemporaries. Don't have time to get into it, but we can kind of read in the Gospels how word had gotten around. No one really knew who Jesus' father was. They counted months back then. And they certainly didn't believe that Christ would, was uh, the Son of God, the enemies of Jesus. So there was that scorn she held on she had on her whole life. There is the pain of seeing her son ridiculed, chased like a dog, fearing for his life, mocked. And then, of course, watching the, the one whom she loved beaten and arrested and nailed to a cross and dying. Think about it, taking the cold, lifeless body of her son in her arms. And she had to place him in the tomb. I often wonder, as Mary held the limp body of her son in her arms if she did not think back to that time when the angel first told her you will give birth to a son and you are to call him Jesus. And that road when she said be it unto me according to that word led to this. Watching him bleed, suffer, cry in pain, those of you who are parents, you know what it's like when your children are crying in pain and you can't do anything about it. She had to stand there and watch her beloved son bleed and die and then to take his body and bury it. That was the road God placed her on. So she did suffer tremendous sacrifice and pain but she also, this road, led to tremendous joys she never would have known. There was a visit from the shepherds. I'm sure that broke the stillness of the night for her and Joseph after the baby was born. There was a visit from the wise men. The Bible says she hid these things in her heart. She pondered upon them. There's a sanctified pride, I would call it, that she's, she had in Jesus' earthly ministry as she saw Him doing these miracles, fulfilling the promise that the angel gave her so long ago. There was the indescribable joy she felt the day of Christ's resurrection, as dark as Friday and Saturday were, Sunday shone with the brilliance of the resurrection, and there was that indescribable joy of knowing that her Son indeed had risen from the dead. And there is, of course, the prominence her name now takes in the story of God's redemption. Mary blessed among women, not to be worshipped, for Christ alone is to be worshipped, but to be respected and blessed among the women of, that has ever lived. And so by saying yes to the road she was offered, Mary's life had an eternal impact. Never would have had otherwise. Had she theoretically said no, we never would have heard of her, more than likely. She would have just melted back into obscurity. Her life would have not had the impact God wanted it to have. But because she said yes to God, she got to experience incredible joys 
that she never would have had otherwise, but it did cost her. But her life ended up meaning something. And that's what I think every one of us want from our life, especially as Christians. We want our life to count for something. That's what I desire, for my life to mean something for eternity. And it can and does when I and when you, like Mary, live under the motto, be it unto me according to thy will. And when you say that, and you mean it, it'll take you to places of sacrifice, but it'll also take you to places of great joy. But there's no better place to be than in the absolute center of God's will. It is His good, perfect, and pleasing will. So what about you? What has God placed before you to do? What is He calling you to go through right now? Are you bucking it? Or are you surrendering? That's the real question. What we learn from Mary is we need to be like her. It's okay to question. It's okay to, to struggle with some, some of that. But you got to get to the place where you, like Mary, say, Be it unto me according to thy word and surrender to where God is leading you. For some of you, it may be a call on your life. Maybe you sense God leading your life in a whole different direction than what you had planned. For others of you, it just may be into a particular area of service or something he's calling you to do at work or at home. And you're kind of, I don't know how that will work out. That's going to change it. That's going to sacrifice here. What I'm encouraging you to do is surrender. And say, Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. Is that how you're living your Christian life under that? What is God calling you to? What is He calling you through? What will your response be? Dad, if you come to the piano, we're just going to end this message by singing a little chorus that all of you know well, but if you do need the words, it's number 466. And Heather, if you'd come and help us lead in this. I'll say yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. <coughs>